we couldn't, I couldn't be more excited to be here with Brian Rashid. Uh, similar to the exercise we did for Anne's conversation, um, we, we love to share our content on Facebook Live. It's really important to us to be able to spread the ideas that we hear t here today um, with our communities at home. Uh, so if everyone can please uh, just take out their phones, it would make my day. Um, I try what I can. Um, search for brunch work on Facebook and then you will see the live stream of this event and then Brian's team is doing it for him so yeah that explains I would it. be doing it otherwise yeah um, and then just click the share button and that way your friends and your communities at home can, can also be part of the conversation our, our, our video on Wednesday, I know a lot of you guys were, on one, uh, were here on Wednesday, but you had 20,000 people tune in, so wow. um, it's worth the effort. Um, but welcome, Brian, to, to Brunch Work. Uh, as, as everyone knows, we host exceptional business tech and creative leaders every single week across the country. We're in New York and San Francisco now, um, and Brian is no exception. He is one of the world's foremost branding and communication experts and he runs a company called a life in shorts uh, so the company does branding digital media and communications so welcome Brian thank you to run trick thank you and thank you guys all for being here and gals um, Saturday like you got a lot of people out on a Saturday we always have a lot of people out on a Saturday I, like, I have to like pay people to hang out with me even like Saturday <laughs> night this is awesome um, so my first question for you is can you just tell us a bit more about a life in short so what kind of companies do you work with um, what, what projects have you been tackling recently sure so we have a digital and communications agency here in in the city and then we also have a satellite office in Medellin Colombia um, and we really focus a lot, are you Colombian? Oh, you're just engaged. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Usually like I say that and well, one I'll person in the see. audience is like, yeah. And I'm like, you're Colombian? And it's like, never, they're never Colombian. <laughs> like you're just like the engaged one, awesome. Like he, you're giving me the confidence. from Spain. From Spain, all right, so it's close. Yeah, I know. Um, so, so we have an office in Colombia, have an office here in New York City. And what why, we do why, is why we, Columbia? I just am very fascinated by the Latin American market. And I'm, I call myself a Latingo. You know what a Latingo is? I do not. A Latingo is a gringo of heart, Latino of, uh, a gringo of blood, Latino of heart. Okay. So I, I mixed the words. In fact, I actually started to create a brand called Latingo, which like grew really fast and then I just didn't have time to do. Anyway, it's a bi, so I have a bilingual brand and I think that Latin America is a very fast growing market and I just love Latin culture. So I kind of just, did my life the way that I love, and part of it is in Latin America, and part of it is here. I spent about six months here, spent six months in You're Latin America. You're very lucky. <laughs> I am very lucky. It's, if you guys have not been to Colombia, you should all go. It's incredible, no matter what the media wants to tell you. Um, and so what we do is we tell stories for brands of all sizes, and really focusing on telling stories that sell. That's kind of my tagline. Um, we've worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, uh, Intel, Credit Karma, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, as well as you know, one, two people shops in San Francisco, um, working with a lot of startups, advise about 100 startups right now, to help them figure out how do they tell their story that sells in a way, in the way of number one, raising venture capital, or number two, getting new users on, on board. And how we do that is a, a bunch of different ways. Number one is, you know, a lot of these big companies have new products or services that come out and they don't really know how to talk about it in an exciting way, so we help them with that. Um, and then in some cases, and this is where we've kind of been growing lately, you have an idea and you want to be able to craft some content around that so we help them actually create the content a very talented man from belarus in the back who's i'm sure on your um your facebook page right now just okay. checking it all out and um, we do a lot of video work for for different brands and then we figure out strategically where is the end consumer how are they going to consume that content what is the action that you want them to take and how do you create content around that. Yep. Um, and so that's, in a nutshell, what we do. I also get asked to speak as a keynote speaker all over the world because yep. of that work. So yeah, of course. That's and kind how of, did you become interested in storytelling? I just have always loved stories. You know, like, I actually am pretty bad at most things in life. Um, like, 
you know, like pretty bad. And but but you're humble. To, yeah, well, I'm pretty good at being humble, but pretty bad at, like everything else. Okay. Um, and so what I've just, what I've realized very quickly throughout like all of my life is that people would come to me to help them tell their stories. So like I actually was a college athlete. I played football. I know I look very scary, um, and I was pretty much the same size back then too. But when I was playing football, the coaches would say like, "Hey, can you take the new?" like the seniors of high school around the campus and tell them about the program. And so I realized, okay, I'm good at that. And then when I, when I went to law school, I went to law school here in New York City, um, I started two human rights projects that I had to individually fund myself. Um, so I fundraised for those, and that was all storytelling. Then I worked for Mayor Bloomberg after I graduated from law school, and <clears throat> I worked for him on his re-election campaign where I was in charge of recruiting lots and lots and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. And when you're asking someone to like volunteer their time, there has to be like a really exciting reason why. And so um, I ended up like recruiting more people than anyone in the campaign. And then when he won, he said, I want to keep you in the administration. What do you want to do? And I said, speech writing. And so what I would do is I would get like hundreds of pages of documents and him or his commissioners would say like, turn this into a one or two minute speech. So I realized very quickly that my skill was taking a lot of information and getting to the core of what really mattered to people very quickly. And what matters to people? I think it depends, yeah. you know, like everyone is, like what, what matters to, we're running a campaign right now for the government of India, and what matters for someone that you're asking to give money for is very different than what matters to you when you buy an iPhone 8. So it just like, and that's the, that's the, the, the punchline of branding. Is it to know your end? There's no one size fits all shoe, yeah. and that's I think what we've been able to kind of figure out. And do you sort of have an overall philosophy for storytelling and branding? Yeah, make you, soul, look at me, and while I'm talking, you say, holy shit, this guy is telling my story. That's it. And when how you can do, you do that, yeah. how do you understand? I just listen. I talk a lot. You guys are like, oh my God, going to never stop talking. <laughs> I talk a lot, and Santa's my right-hand woman. She's been like my, a godsend to the company for the last three years. She knows better than anyone. <clears throat> I listen to everything that, like, to the point where I know what you're doing right now. Looking around, I know what you're like. like, like you're, in, you're you're feeling this. You're like, oh, I'm not sure about this guy. Like, th there's I I am watching every single thing that is happening. You're like, you're shaking your head no, like you're not sure about me, or no, I'm wrong. She's not no. She's like, I'm silent. And so um, I think listening is like really important and asking like. What do you, like, why, why are you wearing this thing? Like, what is interesting to you about this Fitbit? Like, why do you have it on? Or what are you tracking? Why are you tracking it? What is the, is it because you want to count your steps? Is it because you want to track your sleep? Why do you want to sleep better? Do you have a kid? Is your kid, like, entering third grade? Now you want to be more involved with him or her life? Like, why is that important to you? So the Fitbit is actually more about, like, I want to spend more time with my kid then like, I care about how many steps I take, and then under, but understanding that is really the key. So the key to good storytelling, what I'm hearing, is um, being observant. Listening, being observant, asking questions, not assuming. I think the, the, the best answer I can give you, and all of you guys watching on this Saturday, thank you, um, <laughs> is don't assume, I don't assume anything about anybody. Like, I don't, it's easy for me to assume you want to track your steps, but there could be like a real deep reason that has nothing to do with steps. Don't assume stuff. And what are examples of companies, it could be your clients, it could be elsewhere, who tell their story well? Well, you know... And why? So, so I, I think that, you know, this, this campaign that we're running with, with the government of India, they're trying to create a mil they're trying to empower a million people to create a billion jobs across the country. Um, I think that what we're doing well is that, we st you know, you start the story with a, with a moment of impact, which is like almost a million farmers killed themselves in the last couple of years because they didn't have meaningful work. So people are like, wait, what? That's a big number. And they start thinking about that. There's the shock factor or there's the like, go directly to you. You know, I think our, not our client is, uh, Charity Water is not a client of mine, but I think they have for an NGO, how many people are familiar with Charity Water? Like, like just the fact that half of you are familiar with Charity Water means that they're doing something right. I think their, their messaging and their campaigns are so good are so, so, so good. You know, we ran a campaign for Intel called Make It Wearables, where they basically bought this little uh, chip, similar to what would be in a Fitbit, and they had a competition where they, they encouraged worldwide entrepreneurs to build something on the back of this chip. And, you know, it got millions and millions and millions of views, the video, and, and it got what global awareness. What was it awareness. about that video or that story that? I think it was like, at this point, innovation is borderless. 
you know, and I think that like the the lines of 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 separation are blurred by the internet, and that's a really beautiful thing because you have ten teams from all over the place from this very well known central hub in the Silicon Valley of that is Intel, um, that is embracing it. You know, st small st scrappy startups can be a part of the big machine, and all of a sudden those lines get blurred, and that gets confusing for people in the best way possible. And we've talked about companies that tell their story well. Who does a bad job? Oh man, who does a bad job of telling their story? Probably no. I probably don't know because I don't know who they are. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, I, I don't. I don't want to put a company on blast. Yeah, I course. don't know. I don't know. Well, but what mistakes generally do you see a company make? They they assume they assume that they yeah. have the story that you want to hear. You know, um, I like your dress is very different than I'm going to buy your dress. So a hundred people tell you that they like your dress. You go out and spend fifty fifty thousand dollars manufacturing those dresses, and then you go to sell them, and no one wants to buy them. But you said you like them. Yeah, I like them. I don't want to buy them. So I think that like when your story is around an assumption that you know what somebody is going to do without really taking the time to listen. Yeah. And I also think that in the in the media agents in the media world right now, it's dangerous because the the slower, more clunky media companies are doing things for their own interest. Meaning, I am going to spend a shit ton of money on a uh, commercial on face on television. How many people in here watch TV commercials? There's not one hand up. But companies are spending billions and billions and billions of dollars paying for Facebook or for, for TV commercials. Why? Two reasons and two reasons only. They actually don't care at all about their client because none of you are watching. So it's like, wait, if you're trying to sell something to you all and none of you are watching, then why are you doing it? Number one, because they want to win awards. The, the, the agency wants to win an award. So they tell a story that's like in their own self-interest. And number two, the reason that they want to win an award is because they want to charge you more money when you come to them with your hat company. Um, and you had mentioned TV is dead. Uh, Anne said she likes Instagram stories. Yeah. Well, what do you like? I don't, I don't think TV is dead. Okay. I think TV is, a, is very alive, just in different platforms. Um, like, so I, I apologize if I said TV is dead. I, I definitely don't yeah, think. Yeah, that's that. the message I got. Okay, cool. So I don't think TV is dead. I think what you have to be careful of, if you are like, how many people in here want to create a personal brand? So like half of you, a, like a lot more than three fourths of you. How many people in here want to create some sort of brand for your company or your organization that you work at right now? The, the rest of you. So like everyone's participating. This is really an engaged audience. Yeah. I love it when I'm like, how many of you want to create a personal brand? And like half raise their hand. I'm like, how many people don't want to create a personal brand? And then everyone raises their hand. And I'm like, wait, what? Well, we what, are what here happened a, here? We're here on a Saturday morning. <laughs> no, I know. It's amazing. So I think that um, to, to answer your question, like when, you, when you're thinking about creating a brand, you have to know where the attention of the people that you want to reach is. Anne loves Instagram stories because that's where everyone's attention is right now. I, I bet, I bet if, if I asked Anne, hey, Anne. Nobody is watching your Instagram stories. Would you still make them tomorrow? Maybe, but but if you wanted to sell something, would you still use them? Probably not, right? Like, it's a matter of where is the attention now? Facebook ad product is the most sophisticated ad product that exists ever in the history of the world. The amount of specificity that you can have to target an audience to sell your thing is unbelievable. So I don't care. I actually, I, I like TV. If, t if tomorrow TV said to me, here are all the people that are watching TV. If tomorrow I said, how many of you are watching TV commercials and everyone raised their hand, I'd put my ad on a TV commercial. I'm not romantic about where I put the Got ad. Got it. So I where are the, the eyes now? Where are the eyes? That's where are exactly the eyes? That's exactly right. <laughs> where, where are oh, they? Oh, they're in Facebook and yeah. they're in Instagram and okay, they're in Snapchat. Perfect. And, and they're, they, change, they change, but like right now, that's where they are. Snapchat, musically, is kind of popular right now. It's coming up. It's consistently in the top 150. Uh, most used apps in the free app store. Um, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Musical.ly, LinkedIn is still very popular. Um, those, those are the places that I would focus, you know, and also where not the eyes but the ears are equally as intriguing to me, sure. which is podcasts. I mean, if you look around New York City right now, on the top of cabs, they're push, Spotify's pushing their podcast. In the subway today on the way here, I saw Tim Ferriss' show is being pr promoted on Spotify. 
Voice is such an important thing for the future because voice saves you time. You can shower and commute and, and cook eggs and make your coffee all while listening. I mean, maybe you don't want to do all those at the same time because um, that could you know, be like a health hazard, but um, you can still be listening to a podcast. Okay. <laughs> um, and you had mentioned quickly your person, a personal brand is important to a lot of people here. Yes. How do we go about building a personal brand? I think, I think like, think what you're obsessed about. You know, everyone says, you know, let's, let's start here. Think about, like, what you really are obsessed about. Because to make, like, you spent two and a half years of your life writing this book. Like, if that wasn't an obsession of yours with kids and family, like, I'm learning all these things about you today. Like, if that wasn't an obsession of Anne's, there's just no way it would have got done. Because there are millions and I mean millions of distractions a lot like we all know this like we're busy we're trying to make it in New York City it's a tough city it's there's a grind there's family obligations there's money there's the rent there's cockroaches like all these things that happen you know and the second that you've lost track of like the real soul of why you're building the brand in the first place you're finished so the first step is have a really 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 clear why and the second step is every single day dedicate as much human time as you can to doing it. Even if you think it sucks at first, even if you're like, this, this YouTube video, I wanna build a brand around whatever, this YouTube video is no good, this podcast, the audio is not great, just every single day, you know, put out more and more and more content, and then you will start to find the right, the great thing about the market right now is that it's completely open, like a thousand, per, we just did a, a analytics on an article I wrote yesterday, we got 35% of our viewers are from China. Oh, wow. I was surprised about that. But it's, that for me is super exciting because you just don't know what sticks. You just put stuff out there. So get clear on your passion, put stuff out there, and then, really, and then let, the third part is let people know what you're doing slash want to be doing because everyone is so self-absorbed and so consumed in their own worlds that like I have best friends that call me and they're like, hey, how's your life? And I'm like, good. And they're like, so like, what do you do? And I'm like, bro, you've been my friend since we were like six. How do you not know what I do? But it's, it's, like a, good, it's a good listening exercise, right? It's a good wake-up call. Ask your five or ten people in your life tonight what you do, and they'll be like, oh. oh. So let people know what you're doing or want to be doing. If you want to be doing more speaking, let them know, hey, do you have any speaking thing coming up? If you want to do more coaching, coaching. If you want to be selling stuff, selling, right? And what's That's the best what way to sort of share with your commu communities at, at an early stage? Like what you're, what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, what you're doing. I think doing free stuff. You know, I did a whole lot of free. It started in San Francisco. I started this business five years ago in San Francisco. And um, I would literally self-organize talks in my friends' like apartments. I would get everyone super drunk. I'd be like, guys, come, wine, free wine. And then they would come and I'd be like, hey, I'm going to give a speech. And they'd be like, fuck, dude. Like, I just wanted to come like for wine. You know? And I did that for like three months. And then finally it was like, dude, are we going to hang out or are you going to give a speech? Like it became a joke. And I was like, we're going to do both. But then, like, there was one person in the audience that said, hey, I do this event, and you should come speak here. And there yeah. was one. So I would say just, like, doing a lot of stuff. Being real guerrilla about implementing and being, like, super hustle your face off. Like, not romantic at all. I have zero romance around doing what you love. Um, and you mentioned speaking. You're now an international public speaker. Yes. All over the world. You wrote a book about public speaking. I did. I think a lot of us here would love to pick your brain. And sure. some of us will be speaking later during the challenge. Cool. Um, your best speaking strategy. My best speaking strategy is this. Number one, know exactly what the audience wants to learn. Like you and I were chatting before about like who are they, what do they want, why are they here, like what are they hoping. So I could kind of start thinking about in 30 minutes that I got to listen to Ann jam out. Like what, did, what, what do I want to really communicate to you all? Um, so that's the first step of public speaking. The second step is like, it's a real psychological shift, which has been a game changer for me. I'm like one of the weird, weird, weird human beings that like, like I love this more than anything in the world. Like I l like love speaking in front of people. And Why is that? I just love people. I don't know. Maybe I'm like, I love, like I'm a little bit of a ham. Like I love the attention. Like I love your attention. I love the fact that you're looking at me right now. But more importantly, I think that like I've worked really hard for the last five years to kind of figure out how I can add the most amount of value to people. So I'm a weird person that likes public speaking. If you don't like it, there is the psychological shift that really works for a lot of clients that I work with around public speaking is this. 
How many people in this audience right now, raise your hand if you are in your mind thinking and hoping and praying that I am terrible? Nobody. Like, you didn't come here today thinking like, yo, I hope the speaker sucks. <laughs> like, I hope the speaker totally sucks. Like, you came here hoping to learn something, right? So if you are a speaker, if you are communicating a message, you have to recognize the fact that all these people, like all of you amazing souls that take two hours out of your Saturday, when there's a trillion other things you could be doing, are actually here because they want deeply to learn and to connect and to go away a little bit better professionally or personally. It's a big shift. Like the second you can make that shift for yourself, they actually want me to succeed. All of you want me to succeed. Then, then I think that the anxiety of public speaking goes down a little bit. And the last thing I would say is like, if you speak about stuff you really believe in, like every single thing I've said so far, I really believe in and I see the results. The best way to become an amazing public speaker is to really know your stuff and to see the results and to know the, the place people fail in public speaking is that they're just BSing and they're making stuff up because they think it's what the audience wants to hear and they read it somewhere and they think that that's actually what's happening. When in fact, you know, and I keep going back to Anne because she's like great material for me because she just jammed. Like she's had hundreds and hundreds of conversations. Like that gives you a sense of confidence. Like I'm just telling the true story. So it's and authority. It's authority, but it's your authority. It's your yeah. truth. Like I'm not actually trying to convince any of you to like what I'm saying. It's just my truth. I hope you connect with me. It would be great if you connect with me. But like I'm not saying things so that you connect with me. And that really helps for public speaking. The last thing I'd say, it's a little, it's a little hack. Oh, we like Jim, hacks. Jimmy Fallon or your favorite comedian right before you go on stage. Or if you don't like stand-up comedy, call someone that you love and adore and that always makes you in a good mood and be like, yo, like I love, I love my assistant so much. I would call her. I would say, she's like the most optimistic person I've ever met. I'd be like, Santa, just tell me something. And she'd be like, oh! And then like all of a sudden, I'm ready. You know, so call your mom, call your boyfriend, call your daughter, like whatever. Like, hey, Sally, little five-year-old Sally, tell me something. And she's like, you're the most beautiful person in the world. And you're like, ready. So connect for that one minute before you go on stage and you just literally your brain does something. I like that. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. I love Jimmy Fallon and Louis C.K. Those are my two go-tos, you know. Um, any other hacks for us around speaking? I, I, the, 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 real, the real place that you win as a speaker is the preparation. You know, and like okay. knowing if I can basically know what every single one of you wants me to say, if I can find a way in my truth, in my voice, in my experience to communicate that to you, then then you're going to win. I mean, I, I spend a tremendous amount of, you know, the team, they know this like 10, 15, 20 hours before a talk, talking to the organizer, talking to the people, getting emails, asking for what what they're hoping to get. I just I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but like what why are they here and what do they want to learn? I have one more question before yeah. the fire round, cool. and then it's the audience. Um, so we will be doing a really fun challenge after, and it's around managing negative PR. Yes. So do you have any, you, you saw the challenge, do you have any tips you want to give before around sort of storytelling around negative It's interesting. PR? So I started, I started my career sort of working with politicians who, because um, of the Bloomberg background, I did some work with politicians who were experiencing some negative PR. I, I really like hated it um, but I think what mostly because it just I don't know but but I, the thing that I saw that was effective which is a cool thing that you're asking right yeah. now is like owning your downfalls and your failures is a really good idea because it just humanizes you you know there's so many spin doctors out there that just turn the media on right now turn the news on right now and you see everyone trying to spin everything that's happening the thing is like people are human um, mm -hmm. And I think just owning the owning the failure. Okay, that'll help us out later. Um, okay, fire round. Quick. Uh, okay, let's go. Your best favorite business book, and you can't say your own. Uh, well, my own is actually not even my favorite. <laughs> um, uh, best favorite business book would be Reinvent Yourself by James Altucher. Okay. James Altucher is a real like. If you guys don't know who James Altucher is, look him up. He's awesome. He's like the best writer in America right now. I think. Okay, I haven't read your book well. yet, Anne. It's nothing personal. <laughs> Uh, we'll take that home with us. Uh, top productivity hack. Top productivity hack? Uh, bulletproof coffee. Okay. Ready? Here it goes. Dave Asprey came up with this thing, bulletproof coffee. We had some this morning, which is why I'm talking the best. Um, coffee, coconut oil, unsalted organic butter, 
with maple syrup, blend it, watch the cascade. It's just the most gorgeous coffee you've ever seen. It literally cascades. It's the longest lightning run you've ever had. Literally cascades and it's beautiful and it gives you sustained energy because the fat molecules of the butter and the coconut oil carry the caffeine into your bloodstream at a, at a very slow pace so there's no crash. As a writer, you should definitely try this. It's well, four, and it abates hunger. So it's four or five hours of like just straight productivity because you're not hungry and you're jamming. I think they're the same publisher. Yeah, cool. Reach out to Dave. I think um, you'd expect a Latingo to know their coffee. Yeah, uh, but I actually buy Dave Asprey's coffee because it's non-toxic oh, organic really? coffee. Okay. But you know, uh, you know, Colombian coffee is amazing. Juan Valdez, I actually love. You, you from Colombia, bro? I'm kidding, man. I'm kidding. Uh, okay, best piece of leadership advice. Care about your employees way more than you care about yourself. Like I am, I am, one thousand percent committed to painfully over communicating with my employees about what they want because it changes every single day. Um, that's great. Uh, your latest obsession. My team. My team is my obsession right now. Like I give them literally everything I got. These two, and then we have a team downtown. Like. My obsession is my team, and it's the first, I've, for five years I've really resisted building a team, but we just got so much work, it was too busy, so we've built out in the last eight months, and like, my obsession is my team. And learning Portuguese. Okay. I'm trying to learn Portuguese right now. Um, okay, and your favorite brunch food? Favorite brunch food? Yes. We um, are brunch trick. It's so boring, but Eggs Benedict. Okay. Sorry. We do not serve that here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> questions from the audience. Go for it. I have two very good ones. Sure. One, you said you had a legal background. Yes. Also, yes. If that's helped you in forming uh, PR and press, it's almost like an argument. And then two, there's a lot of people have national projects or offices. Yep. Talk about the dates you took that and the content of those ones. Both really cool questions. So let's repeat but, the questions. So the question number one is I have a legal background. Did that contribute to my success now as a writer and a crafter of stories. You know, the legal, the legal background for me was good for a couple of reasons. Number one, I went to CUNY, so it was very social, social justice driven and I, I was very into that. I actually went to law school because I wanted to be the mayor of New York City um, and, and I thought it would be a good kind of launching pad. Um, I had zero interest in practicing law, but I think that that would be cool. And then I went and worked for the mayor and realized I didn't want to do that. Um, just for a number of different reasons, but I think that what it, it did help me with was definitely be, uh, the writing skills. I would say this, for anyone that's thinking about higher education that wants to be an entrepreneur, I would say don't do it. I would say don't do higher education if you want to be an entrepreneur. If you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, then you have to go to law school. I you know, spent $150,000 and right now what I could do with $150,000 for my business would be completely game changing. Um, so that's just a kind of a quick piece of advice for anyone that's like, should I get an MBA, should I get an MBA? I think taste what it actually feels like to run a business with your hands in the dirt for a while. And then if you still, after five years, think like MBA school is for you, then, then think about it. But like, I just think it's not as practical as possible. Number two, when was the moment I decided to take my, my passion project and turn it into a full-time thing? You know, man, I think that I, I had a girlfriend when I was living in New York City six years ago and we were sitting and having dinner and she said to me, you know, I was complaining about my job in the administration and it was getting to the point where I was just like done. And um, she said, you know, you are at your best when you're a free spirit and you spend so much time suppressing that. I don't understand why. And that was a light bulb moment for me. I actually ended up, I quit my job the next day. Um, and then when I really went all in on the, so it's funny because that actually wasn't even the moment when I went all in on my passion project. I just quit. I had no plan. Bad idea really bad idea. I moved to San Francisco and I was like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm in my pajamas until noon and my bank account is going like this and I'm like, what am I going to do? To the point where I actually had to rent out my apartment on Airbnb, my own San Francisco apartment. I rented it out on Airbnb for a profit, use that profit to pay for that apartment, to pay for the food, to invest a little bit into my business and then I went and slept on friends' couches for months at a time. Wow. That was like my start. So that was the moment where I was like, it's like my, my friend was literally like, dude, how long are you going to live here? And I'm like, well, just, I just got another request right now. This is amazing. So like another two weeks. And she's like, no, like get it together. That was kind of the moment where I was like, 
this either needs to be a passion project or it needs to be a full-time business and that's my choice. And then I went in 80 hour weeks for the last five years. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Who else has a question? Go for it. You said not to make assumptions. So yes. obviously when starting, you have to base on somewhat of an assumption. Yes. So where is that line? When do you stop the assumption? Well, give, give me a specific example for you. I want to add direct value to your situation. Okay. So I'm in a company, we're pivoting. Yep. And um, we've been a site that sells emerging fashion designers from all around the world. You sell emerging fashion designers. Designers. Okay. That's been our old business. Yep. Um, for a million reasons, it hasn't been working. Okay. I, Yep. Products from that city. Yep. Um, and so I've made that assumption because okay. from looking at reading a lot, yep. seeing, but you know, I haven't, so I, I mean, I would love to do a much more depth study. I don't have a budget. Like, I'm like, yeah. So, how do you test assumptions? Case. I think that you've got to create a lot of content around, like, so, so you, have, you have an idea in your head, which is, it sounds cool. I, I, not knowing anything about your business, I can't, like, but. It sounds cool. I would just say, like, create a tremendous amount of content around this theme. And the other, the other thing that I would say for you, and actually this is really, I'm happy you asked this, because this is really relevant for anyone that is trying to get more exposure. Right now, the number one most underpriced arbitrage for attention is Instagram influencers. And what that means is you, like, are, what are you how are you making money on your business? Uh, well, just give me one really quick thing. Selling pieces of what? Clothing. And Fine, clothing. clothing. Let's just let's just start with clothing. You have a designer that makes a cool like this shirt, right? You need to identify in these cities, in these four different cities that you'll do over the next year for the three month stints. You need to identify who are the influencers in those cities, and you can literally just look up fashion hashtag fashion hashtag designer shirt hashtag Ecuadorian poncho whatever, right? And then all of a sudden, are you from Colombia or no? Okay, I wasn't sure. So, and then all of a sudden, you see Instagram filters, right, by most popular and then most recent. Go to the most popular ones. See who's talking about fashion in those cities. Hit them up and say, yo, I'm Elizabeth. I have this poncho. For the next, from January 1st to May 1st, we're going to be jamming and selling in Quito. Will you, how much does it cost for you to shout out my poncho to your audience that will be running this crazy sale for four months? Then, Paulina who has 50,000 influencers in Ecuador, puts a picture of you and your poncho up in this store for the next three months, it's a game changer for business right now. Instagram influencers is huge. And they're gonna charge you 50, 100, 200, 500, 600 bucks for a shout out. But like, people are, people are paying $10,000 for an ad in Times Square. They have zero idea if anyone's even looking at it. At least you know for sure. Here's the poncho, it went up in front of 50,000 people. And the other cool thing is, now you can see the 3,500 people that like that image, you, you know who they are and you DM them. Yo, I noticed you like the picture. It's a lot of grinding work, but like this is the way that you make a small business work. Is that helpful? That is helpful. Cool. Yeah. Instagram influencers for you is a good strategy. Put together a $5,000 budget or a 10, like I'm super empathetic to people that have low marketing budgets because I think that you are the truest entrepreneur because yeah. like it's easy for a company to spend $80 billion that's yeah. not theirs, but it's your skin in the game. I want to help you work smart. Instagram influencers right now, I think is a good strategy for you. Very helpful. Yeah. Other Who questions? Who else has a question? Uh, so you were talking about how the second reason is goal and vision is. I'm sorry, can, I was talking about sensing. Um, you were saying how the second reason is goal and vision is finished. Yeah. How did you overcome your lowest point? How did I overcome my lowest point? I just, I, so I never ever stopped believing in the vision of the company to the point where Google actually came to me and they offered me a really good position running a communication strategy thing for Google Glass. And, they, and I'll never forget it. They came to me and they offered me a great salary. They took me to Mountain View. They gave me the tour. They're like, here are the bicycles. And I'm like, oh. And I have like $782 in my bank account. Here are the bicycles. And I'm like, oh, those are beautiful. 
here's the massage room. If you work after five, you can get a massage. And I'm like, here's the organic food, right? And then they're like, and, and here's the salary. And I'm just like, oh. And it was a moment of decision, right? And I just, I looked at the Google Glass and they gave it to me to play with for a week. And I was just like, you know, doing this like thing. I don't know if you guys have seen the Google Glass, but you're like, you know, hitting your face. And then like at one point I like slapped my cheek and I was like, no, like I can't do this. So I think that in my lowest moment, I, I would actually encourage everyone, I do this and I, and I, I share this with people, literally write down wherever, all over your apartment, on your kitchen sink, on your bathroom sink, on your post-it notes, in your phone, make it your wallpaper. What is your why? What, why do you want to do this? For me, I have two big goals. Number one, to help millions of people around the world start businesses that they love because I've seen so many people depressed about their jobs and they just don't know how to get out of it. So if I can help in any small way, like the advice I just gave you, if that can build your business, like today was a complete success for me, regardless of what else happens. One person at a time. The second thing is I wanna speak at Madison Square Garden, sold out, I want you all to come. Um, one day. One day, I think I'm gonna be 44, it's my lucky number, 10 years from now. Um, but um, that would be cool. And so I think that just going back to the why, for me was the thing that helped me when I hit rock bottom. Okay. And also hitting, sorry, I know I talk about, hitting rock bottom is like, what does that even mean? Hitting rock bottom for me is like, I have my business, I'm living life on my terms, I'm doing my thing, but I'm not making enough money. Like, that's not rock bottom. Like, perspective is really important to me. Rock bottom is like, I'm on the street, I have no food, I'm freezing cold in the winter. That's rock bottom. Like, oh, do I have to go get another consulting client or do I have to go get a job at Google? Like, that's just privileged shit, you know? So, like, figuring out what is rock, like, rock, people are so dramatic about what rock bottom actually is. Like, if you think about all the things that are happening in the world right now, you having to go scrape $600 together this week, it's not that big of a deal, you know? Okay, last question, We're back there. My question is on branding. Yeah. So I'm not personal branding. Do you hate me still? Or, no. okay. <laughs> I'm te I was totally teasing, like, I was just messing with you. So, my thing is, I have a consulting business. Yep. So, I taught some millennial training. My goal is business. Millennial training. Okay. But my personal brand, I like to focus on women's empowerment, helping women. Can that be my personal brand? Yeah, my business is different. Is it okay to have that? Completely. Completely So, the question is is it okay if my personal brand and my professional life are different things, right? I'd say yes, and I'd say that you actually have an amazing opportunity right now, because you have a, pay are you working for a company? No, it's my own company. It's your own consulting thing, but you have clients, you have work coming in, Absolutely. you have your thing. Six months oh man, the next 18 months are gonna be so fun for you, because you're gonna hate your life so many times during it, <laughs> like hate your life. You probably hate, you hate your life right now a little bit? A little bit, yeah, so it's cool. I would say there's a couple different things. Why not, why not niche out more that, why not niche out your consulting business more to focus on how to bridge the gap between employers and millennial women? Because if that's where you want your personal brand to go anyway, like empowering millennial women, one of the ways, like think about it this way. Everyone says to me, Brian, you are all over, you, you do a million things. I, it's, it looks like I do a million things, but I'm actually just doing a couple of things in a million different places. So you need to think about what is your pillar, what is, the, what is your top line thing, which is your consulting business. Stay there. S stay there for the next 36 months. Build it out smart so that the personal brand is simply a, a under, like a thing underneath, a pillar underneath. The house is the consulting firm. Think about, for all of you guys, what is your house? The house is the consulting firm. For me, the house is my agency. Underneath that, I have speaking, and I have the podcast, and I have my YouTube show, and I have my social media, and I have my speaking, and I have my podcast, blah, 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 blah. but for you, it's getting people in the door to help bridge that gap. Now, if you can become an expert at how, how do millennial, how do companies find the best female millennial talent, number one, that's a huge value add. Now, I don't know who you're, if you're a B2C or B2B enterprise, but like, if you, don't, if you aren't thinking about how you can become the place that companies come to come to you for your consulting to figure out how can we hire more millennials? Because let me tell you what's happening with companies. They're having a really hard time. They're having a really hard time getting millennial talent because millennials want to work on their own. Millennials want to work with glass windows. Like, 
these stale companies. So if you can figure out the answers for them, that is going to be a very lucrative consulting business for you. At the same time, the value that you're bringing to the millennials is, let's say you niche yourself as, I am only, I only work with the most cutting edge companies and now millennial women are going to be like, yo, I need to know how to get into the, to Uber, to Facebook, to Twitter, to whatever these cool, right? And you're the, you're the bridge. Now all of a sudden you've basically merged your personal and your professional. Here's what you need to think about. And this is like, you have an immense opportunity right now. You need to become the media company for every millennial woman and every company looking to hire millennial women in the world. So I, I need to see from you every week, one, two, three LinkedIn articles. Every, put them on Medium. I want you, 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 you have a nice presence. I want you, you have a good confidence. I want you to literally take your phone out and be like, what's your name? Ashira. I'd be like, yo, this is a, Ashira. You know, Ashira speaks to aspiring millennial women. Today, I'm gonna share with you a little tip about getting into the company of your dreams. You do that on one side. On the other side, you're basically creating a marketplace, right? On the other side, hey, uh, company, you know, the neighbor. Let me tell you about what millennial women want from you. You put out enough of that. You put out a video every day. You put out Instagram snippets every day. You put out three or four articles a week. You do a podcast. I can guarantee you, you do that every single day for the next 365 days. You can do a six-figure consulting business plus speaking plus your personal brand is built into that because you become Ashira, the consultant slash media company for millennial women and companies that want them. You're welcome. Incredible. Um, so thank you so much, Brian, uh, for spending the morning with us. Guys, I, I'd love for you to follow me on the social worlds, www.worlds. Um, I'm just Brian Rashid Global, B-R-I-A-N-R-A-S-H-I-D. Can you send that to them? I yeah, forgot yeah, to absolutely. We'll send the social stuff. Brian Rashid Global on every platform imaginable. We'll, I'm, we'll I'm eating my own food. So really thank you for uh, your attention. It means a lot. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks for that.